The Sultan Muhammad Fatih and his Ottoman army in 1453 took the Quran and threw it into the garbage bin. Is that if Jesus were to give me a command or the world of Islam a command and he tells us stand up, every Muslim will stand. But that holy state which comes back to the world of Islam will not be the ruling state in the world. No. The ruling state in the world is the one which will come afterwards when Jesus returns. And he rules the world from Jerusalem. This religion and this religion and this religion, but they all come from the same truth. In order for you to validate that you have come from the Lord God, you must have a sacred law which has come from him. That sacred law is in the Quran and we follow it. And that sacred law is in the gospel and in the Torah which you follow. So whether you are an atheist, a Christian, Buddhist, a Muslim, or belong to any other religion, my guest today has a message for everyone. As all of us in our own ways ask the question, where are we coming from? And after we die, what will happen? Where we will go? The Christians, I'm Catholic, believe that before this world, as we know it ends, the apocalypse will happen. The end time takes place. And even though God did not provide through his messengers and prophets the exact date and hour, he did though provide hints and signs. And when these signs appear, then we are in the end times. To bring some clarity through very credible information and insight to this subject, I'm pleased that I'm here today with a good friend and one of the leading, to me the leading, Islamic scholars and philosophers in Islamic eschatology, world politics and modern socio-economic political issues. Welcome Imran Hussein. Thank you Christian, I'm honored to be with you again. Thank you for taking the time for this interview. Imran, you wrote many books. And the latest one is entitled Constantinople in the Quran. Now, where is the connection here between Constantinople and the end time? Christian, before we uh, get down to the serious part of this interview, I want to share with you that you have, I'm at now at the age of 76 and a meeting with you today, you've taken me down the road of nostalgia to remember when I used to be a teenager in the Caribbean island of Trinidad and I used to wear the black color. <laughs> so, yes, so you have brought me, taken me back to my teenage times, yes, and I, I am very happy to be again with you, a friend and a brother, a Christian friend and a Christian brother. And we in the world of religion uh, those who faithfully follow uh, Jesus, those who faithfully follow Moses, those who faithfully follow Muhammad, may Allah's blessings be upon them all. We need to come together and to not only defend the truth which has come from the Lord God, but also to articulate that truth in such a way that we will demonstrate its credentials of truth and there is perhaps no better area of uh, study today in which it is possible for us to demonstrate the credentials of truth better than in the study of the end time. Those Christians, those Jews, those Muslims who are able <coughs> to go, excuse me, to their religious scriptures 
and to be able to explain the reality of the world today are the ones who will be best able to demonstrate the credentials of truth. And we are most certainly living in the end times. And it's called the study of eschatology, the study of the end times. And uh, my uh, purpose is to articulate what Islam has to offer to explain the world in the end time. I do not do this in any offensive or any aggressive way. I try to do it in a gentle way, in a persuasive way. And I invite people to think. I ask them again and again when I offer my own opinion, never accept my opinion unless you are convinced that it is correct. This is necessary when we, when we reach out to the secularized world, the world which no longer has any contact with the Lord God in pursuit of knowledge. And it is difficult for them to accept knowledge which comes from a world beyond this world. So they don't, they're not comfortable with going to scriptures and accepting that as knowledge. And so the Jew and the Christian and the Muslim who stands for truth and for justice, because truth not, does not stand alone, truth stands with justice. Uh, must now make an effort to reach out to that secularized world to try to persuade them that what the, religion, the religious conception of truth has to offer is explaining the world today. In this explanation, we say that there are two cities which stand out, most of all, in the end time as the most important cities of all. And they are not London and Paris. They're Jerusalem, number one at the top of the list. And the second one is Constantinople. Um, and I, <laughs> I have to thank the Lord God that I was blessed uh, some 18, nine, 18 years ago to publish a book on Jerusalem in the Quran. And now to complete, I have just finished writing a new book. It's a small book entitled Constantinople in the Quran. Um, there are references to Constantinople and to Jerusalem in the Quran, but it is part of the divine wisdom that he does not mention these cities by name. You got to think, to interpret, to recognize that this refers to Jerusalem and this refers to Constantinople. And insofar as Constantinople is concerned, there is a, a, a passage of the Quran that is, it is dazzling in its implications. And the Quran speaks of a city by the sea. A city by the sea. And then goes on to say that in the city live the people who are supposed to observe the Sabbath. So there had to be the Israelite people because the law came to the Israelite people. There is something called the Sabbath day and the law requires you to observe the Sabbath day. And in this passage of the Quran, we find where the Quran tells us that the Lord God decided to test these Israelite people on the Sabbath day. And those who passed the test remained in his favor. But those who abandoned the law, and I wish I could repeat this word a hundred times, who abandoned the law, the sacred law, and the Sabbath symbolizes the sacred law, invited such a response from the Lord God of his anger that he said of them, be apes, despised. Nowhere in the Quran do we find this harsh language. We find they are people who are like cattle, like cattle, but not cattle. If they have eyes and yet cannot see, they are like cattle. 
Then you have verses of the Quran which say, if you have the sacred scripture on which you, and you do not apply it, live on it, live with it, it's like having a load of books on the back of a donkey. So you are like a donkey, but not a donkey. But this time, it says, be ips, despised, which is the harshest possible language. And the city is Constantinople. And the test to the people of Constantinople were a people who, to, on whom the sacred law of the Sabbath applied, which is the Israelite people. Now the Israelite people were divided into two when Jesus came. One part of them rejected him and henceforth became known as the Jews, as Yehud in the in Quran. But another part accepted him. And in the Quran, they are known as a Nasara, or now they're called Christians. But these people who lived in this town of Constantinople would not be the Jews. They are the Christians, because amongst them, they are those who believe. They are those who have the favor of the Lord God upon them. So a Christian people were tested in Constantinople. And those who passed the test were those who remained faithful to the law. And those who failed the test were those who abandoned the law. And as a consequence, were now punished and cursed to live like apes, despised. This is the introduction to Constantinople in the Quran. You also <clears throat> say that uh, Constantinople will be conquested uh, by a Muslim uh, army. And that was prophesied by your prophet Muhammad. And you, the question is, does, did that take already place? Yes. Well, actually, the conquest of Constantinople uh, is not in the Quran, it's in the Hadith. And there are two. One is a conquest of Constantinople, <coughs> excuse me, by a people who have come from Abraham, Abraham, Islam, through Isaac. And so they're called the people of the house of Isaac. The, the Arabs have come from Ishmael. So this is from Isaac. And these people would conquer Constantinople, so Constantinople will become their city without fighting, only by pronouncing the name of the Lord God and the city becomes theirs. And this obviously would be the Christian people. So a Christian conquest of Constantinople is ordained by the Lord God. He wants them to take Constantinople as their city. This is one hadith. But immediately they take Constantinople, the Antichrist is released amongst them. So from these Christian people who now control Constantinople, you have to look to see in which direction will the, the Antichrist move. Mm -hmm. So that from them will emerge, that will eventually will t take them to Jerusalem, to the state of Israel, and to the Antichrist ruling the world from Israel, from, from Jerusalem. Then there is another conquest of Constantinople. And I mentioned this one, both of these in my book. The second conquest of Constantinople is by a Muslim army. Now why, a Christian would ask, why would a Muslim army want to conquer a Christian city? And the answer is, at the time when the conquest of Constantinople is to take place, there's a timeline of events. And what the prophet has prophesied is a conquest of Constantinople which will take place after what the Christians call Armageddon and what the Muslims call the Malhama, it's the same thing. The, the Armageddon has not yet taken place. And so the conquest of Constantinople, prophesied by Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, has not as yet taken place. 
as a consequence, when that, consequ when that conquest takes place, the Muslim army will not be conquering a Christian city. Because Con Constantinople, 600 years ago, ceased to be a Christian city, is now a Muslim city. So the Christian will ask, not only the Christian, but the rest of the world will ask, but why would a Muslim army want to conquer a Muslim city? Not only would the rest of the world want to ask that question, but every single person living in Turkey and in the Balkans want to know the answer to that question. And I've answered it in my book. The, the prophet went on to praise that army and to praise the commander of that army. This is unusual language. And we say the reason why there is a conquest of Constantinople by a Muslim army, which is praised by the prophet, and the commander is praised, is because this army will correct the wrong which was done by another army in 1453, when an Ottoman army conquered Constantinople. That army wage war in a manner which is in conflict, manifest conflict with the Quran. The Quran says, if your enemy is suing for peace, he wants peace, not war, then you have an obligation to respond and respond with peace. You cannot wage war on an enemy who wants peace. That is in the Quran. The Ottoman army led by Sultan Muhammad Fatih. And I, Christian, I am using my words with great care now. I'm not speaking irresponsibly. The Sultan Muhammad Fatih and his Ottoman army in 1453 took the Quran and threw it into the garbage bin. and wage war against the Christian, Christian city of Constantinople, which did not want war. The emperor wanted peace. And so what was done in 1453 had to be corrected. And this army which is to come, which will conquer Constantinople, will correct the wrong which was done in 1453. There is something else that the, the Ottoman Sultan did. The Quran requires us to protect the houses of God. And it mentions, in addition to the masjid, it mentions the church. It mentions the synagogue. It mentions the temple. And what the Ottoman Sultan did in 1453, was to take the Quran and throw it into the garbage bin by taking the greatest cathedral of the Christian world, Hagia Sophia, which had been their greatest cathedral for 1,000 years, and to shamefully and disgracefully and sinfully convert it into a masjid to the eternal shame and disgrace for every Muslim who still has the capacity to think. But unfortunately, there are some who've lost the capacity to think. It's, and so this army, which is going to conquer Constantinople immediately after the Great War takes place, and we are now on the doorstep of that Great War. It can take place at any time. This army which will go into conquer Constantinople will correct the wrong which was done by Sultan Muhammad Fatih and the Ottoman army in 1453. And if these words of mine are founded on truth, I have nothing to worry about from my critics because the truth will prevail.
I think there's a lot of theology also in this, and I, I encourage our viewers to really research this subject, you know, which cannot be covered in, in five or ten minutes here, and research it on the internet. There are a lot of resources. Read about it, and uh, ha with an open mind and uh, with an open heart, uh, whatever faith you belong to, and this is very enlightened, uh, you know, and um, because uh, when we're talking about uh, science, for example, do you think that the the break between the Russian Orthodox Church and Constantinople right now is this already part of this? Is, has this anything to do with it? There is a Russian Orthodox Church. There is the Orthodox world, and it is without doubt led by the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, by any yardstick or any meter you use to measure power and measure control over people, it is the Russian Orthodox Church, which is the dominant church in the Orthodox world today. Constantinople appears to me to be simply a, a, an irrelevant figment of, of the past. It plays no role whatsoever except theoretical, except theoretical. But de facto, de facto, Constantinople has no role at all. The Orthodox Patriarch in Constantinople has to be a Turkish national. Is that compatible with Christian theology? <laughs> the Orthodox Patriarch in Constantinople by law must be a Turkish national. Is that compatible with Christianity? <laughs> yeah. So no, um, I think that the they allowed uh, the Patriarch to remain in Constantinople in an enclave for essentially strategic reasons to be able to manipulate the Orthodox world. So I don't see any important schism taking place now. The schism which was really important was the one which took place in 1454. And do you know it's there in the Quran? It's there in the Quran. I invite our, uh, our listening, our viewing audience. Uh, I, have, I have made mention of this in my book on Constantinople in the Quran. So when you read the book, you'll find it. But if you go to the Quran, to Surah to Rum, or the chapter of Rum, which is chapter number 30, you'll find where the Quran speaks about Rum. And Rum would be the Christian well when it came to Constantinople and established a holy state in Constantinople. That is Rome in the Quran. And the Quran spoke about Rome <coughs> and said that Rome was defeated in a land close by, referring to the Byzantine Empire. But then the Quran went on to say, because the the people of Mecca who worship the idols were identifying with the Persian Empire, which had defeated Byzantium. And they were celebrating. And we who worship the one God, we identified with the Christians because we have a book and they have a book. So in that context, the Quran says, wait, they're going to be victorious in just a few years' time. And Rome did defeat the empire, the Persian Empire, within a few years' time. But then the Quran went on to say that the Lord God is the one who determines victory. And uh, he did it both before and after. But before has to be before something. And after must be after something. So between the word before and after, there must be something. And this before this, there's one victory, and after this, there's another victory. What is it in between? My answer is, it's the schism of 1054. That there is one victory for the Christian world, which follows Jesus, before, and that took place already uh, uh, shortly after the Quran was revealed. But there is another victory for this Christian world which truly follows Jesus, which obeys the law, which observes the law of the Sabbath. And that victory will come after the Great Schism. So the Great Schism is in the Quran. 
So there is a Christian victory which is coming. The first time the Christians were victorious, we Muslims celebrated. That's in the Quran. And when the second victory comes, we Muslims will also celebrate. We will be happy. That victory which is coming, Christian, my view, is the great war which is coming. A great war which will be fought by a people who are Christians, but who sincerely follow Jesus. And by another people who say they are Christians, but they've abandoned the law. Well, it seems we are in a time, you know, when you even look at our own church, the Catholic Church, or the Christians themselves, they fight each other within their own faith. Um, a question here quiz, uh, quickly about room. You're talking about room of the West and room of the East. Explain room and, and what that means. Good. When? What means room? When the Christian world... Remember, after Jesus, the Israelite people were expelled. The Roman government expelled them from Jerusalem. And they're living now in exile. One part which rejected him and celebrated when they saw him die. And another part which wept when they saw him die. Of course, the Quran tells us what happened at that moment of crucifixion, but that's not our subject today. That part which wept when they saw him die, is now called the Christian well. And the Quran tells us that they were allowed, not the Quran, sorry, the Hadith, that they were allowed to come and conquer Constantinople without fighting. And so Constantinople becomes a Christian city and they establish a holy state. That holy Christian state that you call holy Byzantium, the Quran refers to it as Rome. Rome, however, was tested by the Lord God. The test was concerning fishing. That the, the law of the Sabbath prohibited you from fishing on the day of the Sabbath. So the Lord God sent the fish on the day of the Sabbath and they'll be jumping and you could see the fish, but you're not allowed to fish. And every other day of the week, the fish would not come. This was the test. Those who faithfully obeyed the law and refrained from fishing were the ones who remained as room of the East. Those who fished on the day of the Sabbath and took the sacred law and threw it away eventually broke away from room and became room of the West. It is, this, it is in this room of the West, a people who abandon the law, they will eat anything. They will do anything on this Sabbath. It doesn't bother them. Amongst these people, the Lord God has cursed them and declared, be apes, despise. The Quran is not saying that human beings were transformed into apes. It is the anger of the language, be apes. How would you know when a people are living like apes? Answer, you'll be surprised, Krishna. An ape is naked, but that's his natural way. There's nothing disgraceful about that. But a human being is meant to cover, has a sense of shame. When you see people taking off their clothes and appearing in public naked, those are the apes. The, the ape conducts his sexual life in public, but nothing disgraceful about that. That's his way of life. When you see human beings now engaging in sexual activity in public, those are the apes. Those are the ones who have been cursed by the Lord God. And we find them not in the Orthodox Christian world. We find them in the Western world. So this interview of, with you, Christian, is an interview in which I'm reaching out to Christians in the Western world. And I'm inviting them to think. Because there are, there are pious Christians in the Western world. There are men and women in the, in the Christian world of the West 
who have integrity. And so when these words reach them from a Muslim brother, to open your eyes and see. When you see people living like apes, you must know these are the ones who have been cursed by the Lord God. This is our explanation of room. Imran, um, with your book, you, you hope that you uh, have brought clarity to the subject in such a way that the implications of the prophesied end time conquest of Constantinople can now be understood in a definite way. Why is it so important to understand it at all? Why is it, has it any relevance? The conquest of Constantinople, which will take place after the Great War, and we are now on the doorstep of the Great War, uh, prophesied by Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, will be a conquest which will correct, correct the wrong which was done when the Ottoman army conquered Constantinople in 1453. I have already mentioned the things that they did. When this is corrected, the implication would be that Hagia Sophia would be returned to the Christian people. This is your cathedral. And we apologize to them for what was done. First of all, it was converted to a masjid, which was shameful, which was disgraceful, which was sinful. And I choose my words with great care. And then, <coughs> sorry, they wage war on a people who wanted peace, which was also in violation of the law of the Quran. When this happens, we then will welcome a new relationship between those who follow Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, and those who follow Jesus, peace be upon him. These two worlds will now draw closer to each other in friendship and in alliance. And it is in an alliance of the two people who await the return of Jesus. In that alliance that history will end. History cannot end until truth triumphs over all rivals. History cannot end until justice is established enough. And the poor oppressed masses who have suffered for so long and whose tears have fallen to such an extent that there are more, no more tears in their eyes. These people will have to smile before history can end. And that triumphant end of history, where truth will triumph over all rivals for the last time, and justice will prevail in the world, that end of history will be led by the son of Mary, the true Messiah. And he will be assisted by the followers of Muhammad. That is the importance of the conquest of Constantinople. Will, will at that time when history as we know it ends, when this world as we know it ends, will religion uh, be any part of it or uh, any relevant? When I use the word truth, I refer to truth which has come from the Lord God. When the truth which has come from the Lord God gives us a way of life with a sacred law, it's called a religion. But the Lord God in his wisdom did not send only one sacred law. No, he sent several sacred laws. And so we have a sacred law and you have a sacred law. And what I am doing today in this interview is addressing you, my brother, and asking you gently so to follow your sacred law. Return to your sacred law. And if you see me departed from my sacred law, you must speak to me as well and tell me. Return to your sacred law. There is multiplicity in form. This religion and this religion and this religion, but they all come from the same truth. In order for you to validate that you have come from the Lord God, you must have a sacred law which has come from him. That sacred law is in the Quran and we follow it, 
And that sacred law is in the gospel and in the Torah, which you follow. Constantinople in the Quran, the new book by Imam Hussein. Go on his website, um, and uh, there are other places where you can buy the book. Mm. And I hope in the future we will have many of those, uh, you know, interviews and discussions. And uh, we wish you the best. We wish you health and a long life, Imran, because you're very important. Your message is very important. Thank you, Christian. To everyone. Thank you, Christian. Thank yes. you so much. You're welcome. God bless you.